Mark has a lot of uh, um, qualities, um, both as a city and as a culture. And if we um, if we start with the city, um, it's kind of amazing when you look at this sort of um, it's like a ma man-made mountain range uh, behind me. Um, it's uh, it's a product of you know uh, accumulation, congregation, uh, business, commerce, uh, etc. And every uh, every individual building in its own right is pe perhaps not particularly interesting. It's 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 often very pragmatic and straightforward parameters that have shaped each building, but together the. The sum of the parts becomes something uh, majestic and, uh, and awe-inspiring, and sort of speaks to the, uh, the the power of the human project, which is to uh, uh, you know to build cities and to inhabit this planet. Um, and then I think, secondly, what's uh, and this is maybe more to the culture of New York, is that it's it's not the capital of the United States. Uh, it's it's rather like a capital of the world that. Um, that you have so many different nationalities uh, uh, coming together here, and uh, you know of the of the people you meet and uh, and the friends you get. Uh, some of them are Americans, but most of them are not, and even fewer of them are born in New York, uh, and most of them uh, are not. But somehow it's a uh, it's a city that you uh, uh, belong to by choice rather than by birthright, uh, and that makes it a very sort of open and welcoming. Uh, uh, environment, and I, and I think um, I think maybe this speaks more to sort of the North American culture. But I had um, two interesting experiences that would be impossible to experience in Europe, uh, or at least in Denmark. Is that um, right after I moved here in September 2010, uh, like the month later, I went to Vancouver, which is on the west coast in Canada, um, and I, I gave a talk at something called Urban Land Institute. Uh, and I met this uh, developer, and we like really headed off. And, and then I remember to remind him that, that we actually just opened an office in New York. And his response was, "Ah, so you're here?" Um, and you know, I had actually just gotten off a six-hour plane from New York, and it's you know three time zones further to the west, and it's actually another country. Uh, but uh, but somehow the feeling is, "Ah, you're here in North America. Uh, we're gonna do uh, things together." And, and and in fact, we're doing a lot of projects with this guy. So this sort of instant acceptance. And you know, imagine the parallel in, in Denmark, you would have to fly, if you would fly five, six hours from Copenhagen, you would be in Riyadh or like, you know, in a completely different world. And nobody would say, ah, you're here. Ah, you're, you're in Saudi Arabia, you're here. It, it, it wouldn't make any sense. I mean, I mean, of course, like compared to Denmark, uh, you know, Denmark being the most socially equal country in the world, uh, uh, you have a lot of social uh, difference uh, in terms of economy uh, uh, here in, uh, in New York. And, and of course, in New York, it's quite blatantly obvious because, like, some of the some of the penthouses, like the the penthouse in that stack of uh, of blocks that has like the own design, um, the penthouse uh, sold for around uh, 60 million dollars uh, which is of course like a big check to write for uh, for, for anyone um, and then you have uh, homeless people on the street but in fact like everything you see from basically from Brooklyn Bridge all up along the river that's NYSHA that's uh, uh, public housing um, actually um, you know, like New York is almost like a social democratic uh, city. Um, but there is a, there is also like a major movement for making sure that the city stays diverse. Um, the building we just finished on the west side of, uh, of Manhattan, the Warped Pyramid, um, some of the apartments, uh, you have to pay $20,000 a, a month in rent, but 20% of them are actually affordable. So you can get a studio for five hundred and thirty-seven dollars uh, per month in rent. So, so it is also a city that I think, of course, you can always do more. But it is a city that that does a lot 
to uh, remain diverse, uh, both ethnically and culturally, but also socially and economically. One of the things um, that is true uh, in New York, and it's, it's true anywhere, but like it's so sort of iconic in New York, like it's like where we're standing now, it's Brooklyn Bridge Park. So all of this uh, was uh, piers, industrial piers that have now been converted into, uh, you know, a really enjoyable park. Um, the entire perimeter uh, of Manhattan, of course, historically, when you look at maps that are like 50 years old, it's all roll on, roll off piers. Um, that's also why the entire city is actually encircled by the West Side Highway and the FDR. Uh, so, um, so in a way, until recently, the river was seen as uh, like the rail yards. And I think, of course, like now, New York, and I, I would say like maybe the last 10 or 20 years, the most exciting developments uh, in New York has actually been all these conversions of infrastructure into uh, social and environmental um, amenities like Brooklyn Bridge Park, uh, the, the um, South Street uh, uh, Seaport, you have the, the whole um, Hudson River Park, you have the, the High Line, which is a uh, former train tracks that have been converted into this elevated uh, park and promenade. Um, so, so you have like this engine uh, of transformation that is that is turning uh, former industry into uh, into public programs. Again, like this idea of social infrastructure, but but almost like an approach that I think is very true to the character that you find uh, in this city. It's quite funny, when I, when I came to New York, everybody said like, why do you want to be here? Like, we have the most terrible rules. It's the land of litigation because everybody lawyers up instantly. Everybody's afraid of like, even like interpreting the rules because you could get sued. And uh, you know, the developers, they don't care about anything but profit. Uh, so uh, why do you want to come here? And then like, like at least one, one thing is that it's a lot easier to do a high rise in New York than it is in Copenhagen. And believe me, uh, I've tried. Um, and I think like different projects have different uh, opportunities, different typologies have different challenges uh, and opportunities. And I think the, um, the skyscraper as you see it is such uh, a parametric typology that it's, it's really driven by the mathematics of, uh, of leasing depths and elevator counts and, and waiting times uh, and fire egress. So um, if, if they look very much like super efficient uh, boxes, uh, it's because they are. And, and you can see some of them, actually like where we're standing, you have like a nice little history of the evolution of the skyscraper because it's a, it's a typology that, that evolved around the, the turn of the, uh, uh, you know, from the, from the 19th to the 20th century. Um, but here you can actually see pre-modern high rises and, and essentially they are like extruded chateaus. So they're basically like buildings that the way you used to make them, just stretch taller. At some point, so they have the same awnings, they even have the same like the, 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 the same sort of uh, uh, segments, they're just like stretched vertically. Then came uh, in 1916, like there was a building called uh, 120 Broadway and it became so big and bulky but still just like an extruded chateau um, that, uh, that the, the neighbors complained and they made the 1916 uh, zoning uh, envelope uh, regulation that has, has a formula that ensures that from the street you can see the sky and light comes down. So that created those pyramid shaped uh, towers. You can see like a nice one there where as they go up, they step back. Um, and then you have like the, the, the modern high rises Sadly, you only see kind of the, uh, the more ugly ones, but like hidden in there, you have Chase Manhattan Bank. You can actually just see Chase Manhattan Bank from the side. 
Um, then came uh, postmodernism, where you started getting like these little pyramids on top because like so somehow modernism got too boring. Then you have some of the more recent stuff in the term of Frank Gehry and uh, and SOM. So like you have this little history of um, of the skyscraper, but but the interesting thing is that all all of them are somehow designed according to a very rigorous logic, and it's because. To, to build something that is 50 stories tall or 100 stories tall, it's so expensive that um, nobody wants to flip a coin or do something wild. So any experimentation you do has to be incredibly carefully considered. And somehow, rather than ignoring the parameters, you really have to put yourself into the parameters and, uh, and make it happen. And, and, and in that logic, we're actually doing a a handful of skyscrapers right now that all somehow uh, try, to, try to take that same set of, uh, of parameters, recombine them in order to create something, uh, something that New York hasn't uh, seen before. Is it a dream for an architect like you to have a high rise in New York? Uh, of course. I mean, I must say that it was quite funny like when, we, when, we got the, when we got the job to do the VIA building. Um, the client said, you know, we try to do a, like a, a tower on a podium. Uh, the city thinks it's too conventional. The site is too important. It's, it's basically when you're driving up the West Side Highway, you're looking straight at this building uh, and then uh, the highway turns around. So the, the city really wanted something more significant. So he said, like, why don't we do a mid-rise? I've seen what you've done in Copenhagen. You're so good at it. Like, why don't we try that here? And I was like, damn, you know, like, I finally get invited to build in New York, and then they want me to do a, like a small building. That's like, a, that's not fair. And welcome to New York. 